in um, the Soteri Apostolic College of Biblical Studies, then this teaching is going to be a part of your assignment. And um, I'll share more about that once we get done. So let's get excited about getting into the Word of God. And I'm going to give you a few moments if you have your Bible or if you have some other type of device that you can use to pull up the scripture. We're going to, um, let's see. We're going to directly to Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 32. Now, I'm not going to read that in its entirety. I'm just going to kind of leave it up on the screen for a little bit. And for those of you listening, <laughs> because again, I'm working with dual audiences here. So for those of you listening, then I am, um, we're coming out of Genesis 22 verses, excuse me, Genesis 32 verses 22 through 32. All right. So again, Genesis 32, 22 through 32 for the sake of you all who are listening, but for those of you who are watching, then you wanna go ahead and pull your device out, um, pull your Bible out and go ahead and get that scripture open. So we're gonna be talking about the struggle to change. And for those of you watching, you can actually see an image that I have with, um, it's depicting what that struggle looked like. And so what we're gonna be looking at is the struggle that Jacob, um, his wrestle, his attempt and the tenacity that it took in order for him to facilitate this change, to manifest the change that he wanted to see take place in his life. Now, each of us have areas in our lives where we need change, where we want change, places where we wanna see God. And so what this teaching is designed to, uh, to impart is that along with anything you want God to do in your life, it's gonna require some effort. It's going to require, and in some cases, depending on what that change looks like, and we'll talk about Jacob again, I'm not going to read the entire chapter because I want you all, particularly my students, I want you all to become more familiar with the word. I want you all to take the responsibility and be accountable for um, studying the scriptures for yourself. But for what Jacob needed God to do in his life, this was not something you can do at the altar with a greasy cross and two good fervent prayer warriors who are praying the walls and the paint off the walls. But I'm talking about a place in your own walk, a place in your own relationship with God, an altar you have built where you can go in and struggle and wrestle until you see change come, until you feel the chains falling. And so when we talk about the struggle and when we talk about what it looked like for Jacob, let me give you a little bit of history. Jacob was born as a twin. He had a twin brother. His brother's name was Esau. And at, even before the boys were born, when they were in the womb in utero, there was a struggle over identity. And I know I'm already talking to somebody. There was that struggle. Who am I? What is my purpose? What is God calling me to do? Where do I fit in the grand scheme of things? And so with that, the Bible says that Rebecca, their mother, had this war, this struggle. You know, if you've had children, I've had five, all natural, praise Jesus. You know what that feels like. You, well, if you, I've never had twins, but even with one, when they get to kicking and carrying on, you feel like it's two or three in there. But at any rate, you feel like there is something going on in me. What is going on? And so the Bible says that Isaac went and, and he uh, inquired of the Lord, about what was happening with his wife because he perceived she was under duress. She was going through some issues in pregnancy because of the struggle in the womb. That's a whole nother message. But with that, the Lord revealed to her that there were two nations and that one nation will serve the other. Now, bringing you up to where we are, well, let me move fast forward a little bit. As these boys were growing up, their personalities begin to take shape. And again, that's another message. As we mature, some of us are wondering, well, why am I in the same place? Why am I not moving forward? Why am I stuck? It's because the, the change and the evolution of your personality is going to be contingent upon your growth and your spiritual maturity to the degree that you are, uh, you know, applying yourself, applying scripture, applying, applying principles and being obedient. You'd be amazed at the things we don't experience in life because we lack just areas of simple obedience. We just, we just, sometimes we just miss it. But with that, you will find 
that as you evolve, the Bible talks about Jesus at 12 years old, his parents were looking for him. Where did they find Jesus? In the company of scribes and lawyers, okay? Or in other words, he was in the company of the scribes and Pharisees and doctors of the law. So at 12 years old, he had reached a place of spiritual maturity to where his company changed. Again, that's another message, okay? Um, and for those of you in the Soteria Apostolic College of Biblical Studies, this course falls under prophetic teachings. And so as you're listening and you, I've already given you four messages out of the, this one passage. I've given you four messages if you were listening. So as you mature, as you grow, as you develop, as you yield to the things of God, then there becomes an evolution. It, it, things begin to change in your character. Things begin, things begin to change in your personality to the degree your surroundings change. Again, Jesus, right? He was found in the company of these great learned men, scholars. That's where he was found. So again, many times we wonder, well, why this is not happening? Why you have to take accountability, be responsible and be accountable for your own growth. Okay. So going back to Jacob and Esau, so as they are maturing, their personalities take shape. Esau's personality and his destiny takes him out to the fields and he's hunting and he's doing his great thing out in the field. However, Jacob's personality begins to develop and evolve and his takes shape to where he's hanging around his mom and his dad, for the most part, he was close to his mom. Now, sometimes you fail to understand why you feel connected to certain people or why you are disconnected from certain people in certain seasons of your life. But what you wanna understand is just looking at, again, talking about the struggle to change and looking at Jacob's life is that his destiny required him to be connected to certain people. And I can talk about myself as a young girl growing up. I always found myself in a company of older people. I, I don't know. I mean, of course, I know now, but at that time, I just never knew why. I always felt more comfortable around older people, around my elders. And so I was always close to my grandparents. I was close to several of my aunts and uncles. Um, and even growing up as a child in church, I was drawn to the elders. I was, I was not one that clicked with the younger women, young women my age. Uh, you know, it's not that we didn't get along, it's just we didn't have things like that in common. What the discussions they had were not discussions that I was interested in. I was more interested in the weightier things, the weightier matters of the law, not knowing then that God was preparing me to manifest the prophet, to manifest the apostle, to manifest a pastor of pastors. I had no idea. So again, as your destiny evolves, as your, as your, as your personality evolves, you will find yourself drawn and connected to people who are intentional. God has intentionally placed them in your life to help mold and shape it for the next season. So you will find with Jacob that he was more drawn to his mom. Later on, we find out that he becomes what the prince of Israel, the, um, the prince of, um, uh, of the tribes, the father of the tribes, the nation of Israel. So now we understand why his destiny required him to be more homebound, to be close to mom and dad, as opposed to Esau. So now we see, so there are things sometimes growing up, you don't understand why am I this way? Why am I drawn to this? Why am I drawn to that? Things won't make sense to you until you begin to evolve, until you grow, until you mature. Then you have that aha moment. Oh, okay, now it makes sense. Now I know why I was more drawn to this. Now it makes sense. It won't, some things we're looking for God to make sense out of it right now. And it's not meant to make sense, but it's not, it's not meant to make sense for you right now. There are things that God tells me all the time. And I'm like, God, I don't understand why I'm doing this. I don't understand why this is happening. The Bible says our ways are not like his ways, right? His thoughts, not like our thoughts. High of the heavens from the earth, so his ways from ours, his thoughts out. So there, and don't, and especially for my overthinker people, don't always try to frame your mind around figuring out what God is doing and why God is. Some of this stuff will not make sense until it's time to make sense. So your job is to be compliant, is to be submissive, is to be obedient and go with the flow of God, even when you don't understand it, okay? So bringing you up to where Jacob is in um, this place of struggle. Again, he was named Jacob. The name Jacob means supplanter or a deceiver. And so we find that throughout the course of Jacob's early life, he did operate in these types of spirits. And it troubled him to the point where again, when he began to evolve, the Bible, when you begin reading in Genesis 32, 
and you look at where he now evolves as a father, as a husband, and he's ready to take on his family. But Jacob understands something. And this is kind of that um, pivotal point uh, or tipping point where a lot of us um, are. I'll talk about me. You're at the tipping point where you realize the person who you were is not the person who you're becoming. And so change has to take place. And with that change, it's not something you can ask somebody to help you do, or it, it's not a prayer that you pray. And I really pray the body of Christ gets it. It's not a prayer that you can pray. It, it's not a dance that you can dance. It's not a tongues that you can speak in tongues. That, it is a tenacious engagement and interaction in the spiritual realm between you and God. And this is where we find Jacob. The Bible says he set his family to the side. He set his, his uh, servants one way, his family another way. And he began to find himself alone with the Lord. And there are times when you find the Lord drawn. Some of you are there. Some of you, this may be for a season to come. And you'll know when you get there, oh yeah, the woman of God did say that. So if this is not your season, it's not your season. But it doesn't mean you don't need to hear what the spirit of God is saying to the church. You need to hear it. So that when it happens to you, you know, it won't take you by surprise. Oh my goodness, what is happening? God, are you mad at me? Because it's going to seem, you're going to feel alone in that season. Jacob found himself alone. He drove his family away because he understood that in order for this change to take place in my life, I'm going to have to struggle. And this struggle is going to, listen, it's going to be a messy struggle. It's going to be a hurtful struggle. And there, there may be injuries. I feel the presence of God. I may incur injuries. OK, because listen, when I talk about injuries, I'm not talking about being hurt, hurt. Now, Jacob was hurt, physically hurt. But I'm talking about sometimes in order for that ch uh, that change to be facilitated in your life, then you're going to have to go back down the hallway of your past and confront some things. And this is what Jacob did. Jacob told that angel, I will not let you go until you bless me. Now, look at what Jacob had during this time. So Jacob is not talking about material blessings. Jacob is not talking about the blessings of a wife or the blessings of a spouse or the blessings of children or the blessings of wealth. He had all of that. OK, Jacob had he had family, he had wealth, he had servants, uh, you know, he had he had um, prestige and he had honor. So this place in, uh, uh, of change that Jacob was um, engaging the atmosphere of heaven and engaging the heavenly host and engaging the throne room was not so that he could have some more money. It was not engaging God in this wrestle for a new house or a new car. This was none of these material things that sometimes some of us get blindsided by. I taught a message a few weeks ago that if we seek the kingdom, all of these things will be added. There are some things that some of us are praying for that it's not even, it, it's not even something you need to pray for. You, you, the young people say, you're worried about the wrong thing. If you learn how to struggle with God in that place of prayer and so that you can get God to help you identify and overcome in the areas where you know you fall short, everything else will come to you. So some of what we're praying about, and James talked about it, James said, you pray and you don't have because you pray and you ask amiss. There are things you want to consume in your flesh and God is not interested in that right now. God wants to get to you. OK, so with Jacob, Jacob understood that he was evolving as a father, as a husband, as a herdsman, as a, a, a um, employer. He was evolving and he understood I can no longer proceed in the state that I am because Jacob managed by the grace of God. Jacob managed to be successful, even with the wounds that were inflicted to his soul that he encountered throughout his childhood years, things that happened between him and his mom, things that happened between him and his dad, things that happened between he and Esau, his own twin brother. And not only that, having been forced from home, having to run for his life, and then having to deal with Laban and all that went along with that. So again, Jacob is not wrestling with God for money. Jacob is not wrestling with God for a career change. Jacob is not wrestling with God for a wife. He had two and two concubines. So that was an issue. He was not wrestling for children. He had 12. He was not wrestling for wealth. He was very wealthy. Jacob was wrestling because he understood that there was a place in his soul that needed to be healed. 
And so there are us, some of us who have managed to be successful. We've managed to own property. We've managed to marry. We've managed to have children. We've managed to do ministry. However, there are still wounds in our souls that can prevent us from successfully operating or stepping into the new season. There was a new season that Jacob knew he needed to enter into and there was also a season that God was inviting Jacob into. However, Jacob knew within himself, I, I, listen, I can only go but so far. And that's a place that, that, I, that for, if I can be transparent, that's a, that was a wake up moment for me. There was a, God said, you can only go but so far until you wrestle. And so there will be seasons of your life where God says, get quiet and wrestle. <laughs> get quiet and wrestle. Get quiet and, and struggle. Get quiet and engage me. Come and get in the boxing ring with me. Come and get on the football field. Come, and, and like the Bible said, he said, come let us reason together, right? The prophet Isaiah said, though your sins be as scarlet, they should be made white as snow. So there is a place, David, and I don't wanna give, and okay, those of you who are in the apostolic college, you cannot use David as an example, <laughs> okay? I was trying not to get away from using biblical examples because those of you who are taking this course, you're gonna have to give me an assignment, okay? So you can't use David. Sorry, I already used him, so you can't use it. But with David, David, David had a place of struggle when his father, when, when his sins were made, um, were brought before him, okay, and he had to pay the price in the, uh, at the tune of losing his son, he engaged in prayer, the Bible said he fasted, he shut himself away, and until the word came, okay, your son has passed, then he got up, and he understood, okay, I lost the battle, right, he walked, that was David's limp, Jacob's limp was a physical limp, Jacob's limp was the angel of the Lord, um, you know, had to touch him in the hollow of his thigh to get him to let go. And it wasn't, come on people, it wasn't so much that Jacob, um, uh, you know, the Bible says he prevailed. He prevailed with God and he, he overcame and he got his name changed. But I want you to understand that God allowed it, okay? God allowed it. So please don't ever think you can fight an angel and you can win. God allowed it. Why? Because he saw that Jacob was unwilling to let go. And so the price that Jacob had to pay for the remainder of his life, not only was that the price, but it was the proof. So there was a price and there was a proof, okay? The price Jacob had to pay was the limp, but the proof was also the limp, just as Jesus paid a price and the proof was in the scars. Remember when they, uh, Thomas said, I don't believe it except I see it. And Jesus said, look, behold the scars, right? And so there are those of us who the proof, okay, the price is whatever you had to go through whatever your struggle process, your struggle season look like. And then the proof is what, you, what you're walking away from that with. So there's the price and there's the proof. So Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord because Jacob understood that there's a next level, there's a next season, there's a next dimension, there's a next thing that I need to step into as a husband, father, employer, son of God, that I'm unable to because I'm carrying this name. That name was Jacob's baggage. That name represented all the pain from childbirth throughout his young adulthood. It, every time somebody called his name, it reminded him of the pain of being left behind or coming from behind. And many people who battle with rejection, okay, uh, uh, you know, they understand that, you know, I feel like I'm going through cycles. I, there's one day I feel strong, one day I feel empowered, one day I feel encouraged. And then the minute somebody calls that name, the minute somebody talks about that thing or the minute I overhear that thing, it takes me back to that cycle. And so Jacob could be doing fine, holding his children, embracing his wives, what have you. And then somebody says, hey, Jacob, guess what? It reminds him of that pain. It reminds him of the place where he wanted to escape from. And in order for him to escape, this was a place he had to come face to face with the father. And so there was this struggle to change that Jacob engaged in. It was very costly. It was um, very tenacious. This was not a one time, can you pray with me? Can we touch and agree? This is not one of those types of prayers. The Bible talks about different types of prayers. This was not that type of prayer. This was not, not an intercessory prayer. This was not a pray with me prayer. I'm not saying anything is wrong with that, but I'm just saying, for certain levels of breakthrough, for certain levels of change to be manifested and evidence in your life, people of God, you're gonna to have to learn how to build your own altar and go before God for yourself and bring all that ugly stuff, bring everything that you don't want anybody to know, bring all the shame, bring all the stuff that's hidden. The Bible says Saul had baggage. She was hiding behind the baggage. There are people who are trying to be great 
where they have baggage that they don't want anybody to know about, things they don't want people to know about. And so God is saying, in order for you to step into this next place, you're going to have to leave shame behind. Okay, you're going to have to leave that pain behind. And so in order to do that, you first have to confront it because you can't defeat an enemy that you can't see that's, that doesn't have a name. You've got to give him a name. You've got to give him um, his identity. You've got to talk about what that looks like. And then you go after it. So in this particular instance, there are two places that are mentioned. Okay, those of you taking the assignment, you'll see this as a part of your assignment. Jabbuk, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and uh, Peniel, okay? And if I mispronounce it, forgive me. Um, there are two places. Number one, this the Jabbuk was the forward, kind of like a, a place where Jacob uh, separated his family. That word in Hebrew means emptying out yourself. Again, this is not the kind of thing you do with people around. Jacob demonstrated this for us. The scriptures have demonstrated this for us. This is not something you do with folk. This is not something you do with an audience. This is a place uh, where only you can God, you and you and only you and God can fit in this place. In this dimension of prayer, only you and God can fit there. So you can't invite people there. Uh, Jacob demonstrated that even those very close to him, his wives, his children could not go there. This was a place that was isolated, consecrated, sanctified, and set apart for God and Jacob. So that Jabbok means a, an emptying of yourself. Because a lot of us have crutches. We have things that kind of help us uh, get to where we need to go. You know, we, whether that you want to call them a wheelchair or cast, or sometimes we have people crutches. You know, I'll do this if so-and-so goes. Remember, um, I think Sisera said that. And not Sisera, um, Balaam, not Balaam, Lord, um, Balaam, uh, what's his name? Um, Barack said it to Deborah, I'll go fight if you go with me. And so he needed Deborah to be a crutch. And so sometimes we have people crutches and God's trying to, you ever seen some of those miracle crusade services? I was always mesmerized as a child when I watched them and that's wonderful, but they're also people crutches. Now try hanging that up on the wall. <laughs> you know, we need people. If you go with me, I'll go. If you call me back, I'll feel encouraged. If you pray with me, I know God to do it. So you've got to get away from that. You've got to, you got to break away. There was a movie, um, Forrest Gump movie, and he ran as a child. He had, I don't know if he had what kind of issues he had with his legs, whatnot. And he was in these, um, in these, uh, I don't know, some kind of restrictions or I don't know what to call it. <laughs> anyway, when he ran, as he continued to run, those those crutches and braces broke off, braces, leg braces. Those, as he ran, the leg braces broke off of him. But as long as he remained in those braces, he remained restricted. And he he was he was confined, right? No one would let him go but so far because, hey, you're in braces, you're in crutches, and you're still dependent. Um, but when he ran, and as he continued to run, the strength of it, as, as he ran, his legs gained strength. And some of us were not able, you know, you feel, I, let me just say what I'm hearing God say. We are, um, we fail to see our own strength because we continue to lean on people. And so sometimes God will remove the crutches so you will learn to stand on your own. Think about that as a mom raising my children, trying to train them on a bicycle and, you know, have the training wheels. And when I, when they learn how to, uh, um, pedal without, you know, <laughs> wobbling. and <laughs> Trust me, that was a, that was a very painful process to watch. But when they learn how to do that, and I noticed that, you know, the wheels begin to lift up off the ground as the bike started rolling. Guess what? When they got off the bike, I pulled that bike to the side, grabbed the pliers and pulled those training wheels off. And so you can only go but so far with training wheels. You can only go but so far with braces. And so that jab is a spiritual place. It's a dimension in the realm of the spirit, spirit where God wants you to stand up on your own two feet, not lean on your man of God, your woman of God, your spouse, your kids, your degree, your money, or whatever other thing that you that 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 you know makes you feel comfortable. God wants you to strip yourself and come naked and come by yourself. You can't bring company with you. You can't bring the crutch with you, the wheelchair, the per, your best prayer partner, your best prophet. You can't bring that. You have to, if it, listen, that's only if you want change. That's only for those who want change. If you're comfortable with where you are, hey, keep your crutches and, 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 and that's just, you know, hey, everybody, that's your choice. But for those of you that are looking to go to that next place in God and you want what God has for you, Jesus said in my house of many mansions, when I saw when told you, I'm going to prepare a place. So there are always prepared places for us in the realm of the spirit. 
And the Lord is always inviting us into those places, but it, you gotta, you gotta pay the price. It's a ticket. You gotta, you know, you just don't step into that. You have to be invited. Right. Um, so with the jab, I just kind of want to talk about that a little bit more is helping you to understand that, um, this place is, it means emptying out and it's where you have to, um, you go solo by yourself, okay? The other place that's mentioned um, in these um, 10 verses is pineal, or pineal. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it, okay? <laughs> but it, this represents the face of God. And so guess what? You don't get to pineal until you get to Jabbok. And I always, I all as a prophet, I'm always talking about processes because everybody in the cousin is, I receive it, I receive it. Oh, you're about to see the face of God. I receive it. And a lot of prophets are going to stand and be judged because they have they have failed. And Jeremiah talks about it and Ezekiel talks about it a lot, is they have failed to give people the whole counsel of the word. And so a lot of folks are living off of a half-baked truth and they're expecting God to do things and they have not receive the whole counsel of the of the word the whole counsel of the lord before you get to pineal there you first you you got to go to an emptying out place first you you got to go when you think about jesus on the mount of transfiguration yes he had 12 apostles he only took three right and so yes you may be called many are called but few are chosen it's not enough to have the title it's not enough to have the audience it's not enough it's not enough people of god there are still processes and there's still a choosing of the ranks. And that choosing is gonna be contingent upon who God can trust. Who can God trust? Who did Jesus trust? He didn't trust all those 12 apostles, right? Yes, he was in company with them. Yes, he taught them. But when it became time to be invited to the next level, it was only three. And you saw what happened to Peter, <laughs> okay? So you don't get to Peniel, you don't get to the face of God until you empty out yourself. Some of us fail to reach dimensions in prayer because we don't empty out ourselves. We come to God in prayer and we bring what everybody else has done. Lord, did you see what Janie did? Lord, did you hear what Mary said? Lord, did you see what Benjamin did? did you? And God is saying, listen, until you empty yourself and come before me like a child, naked and innocent, then we can talk then you can see my face. But until then, I don't wanna have conversation about who did it and, 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 and what you gonna do and God, where you at and God, why me? We can't have those conversations. You gotta have a mature prayer language to get to Peniel. And that mature prayer language is coming before God, emptying out yourself. I'm tired, God, of being called this deceiver. I am tired. I've come to a place I'm weary in my soul right? Uh, I think it was David said, my eyes prevent the night watches. I mean, I'm just, my eyes, you know, uh, are, and he talked about how there was pain in his eyes. He could hardly see because his, he, he was crying. You know, people crying, their eyes are all swollen and they can hardly see, you know, and so Jacob, Jacob reached a place where he no longer wanted to continue the way that he was despite his success, despite his accomplishments, despite the wealth, that, that meant nothing. Lord, there's a place in you that I need to see change manifest in my life. And so when I talk about the struggle to change, for those of you who are um, students in the Apostolic College, this is what we're talking about, all right? So I'm gonna come to an end and here's what your assignment. Again, this is now those of you who are listening on the podcast and listening on live, just hold on for a minute, okay? But for my students, all right, here's what your assignment is gonna look like. Your assignment is gonna be located at tinyurl.com slash struggle to change. Again, tinyurl.com slash struggle to change. All right, your assignment, you, you're gonna have two assignments and this is um, not time sensitive, work at your own pace. But your first assignment is using this model and what I've showed, I've showed you, demonstrated rather, the observation, interpretation, application, biblical study model, all right? Observation was what was happening in Jacob's life, what happened in his womb, what happened with his mom. Interpretation is um, how I identified Jabbok, I identified, uh, what was the other place, uh, Peniel. Application is, what does that mean for you, okay? How does that, what does it mean? What is God saying to me out of this passage? So I use that model. Using the same model, your assignment is 
is to identify a passage of scripture. And remember, you cannot use David because I already used it. So sorry. Uh, identify a passage of scripture that narrates the struggle of change, just like what I talked about here with Jacob. All right. I want you to reference the verses of scripture and I want you to identify the people involved. Whoever they were, give me that key person. But if there were other people involved, in this lesson, I talked about Esau, talked about Rebecca, talked about Jacob, um, excuse me, Esau, I talked about his wives, his children, talked about um, Laban, okay? So identify the other people involved and what their roles were, if any. Talk about what their roles were. And then I want you to define those key places. Remember, I defined for you Jabbok and I defined for you Peniel. So that means you've got to look up what the Hebrew, if you're going to do your research out of the Old Testament, you need to look up your Hebrew meanings. If you're going to do research out of the New Testament, you need to look up the Greek meanings and, and talk about what that looks like. My example was Jabbok means an emptying out of yourself. I said Peniel was a place where I can see God. Okay. And what was the application to that? I can't see God until I empty myself out. So you're going to locate key places in your, in your um, assignment and look, look up what that means and, and, and tie it all together. All right. That's the first assignment. The second assignment is I want you to talk about yourself. All right. Talk about your struggle. And you don't have to get specific if you don't want to. That's fine. Um, but if you, like I said, find yourself at a, this intersection or a tip, tipping point to where you say, OK, God, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm boxing. I feel like I'm only going but so far. I know there's another place in you I need to go, but I feel like I'm being held back. I feel like I'm restricted. So then you're at that place where you're struggling to change. And what does that look like? All right, who are your key players? Who are those people that are determining factors in, in your change process, okay? Again, and in your assignment, you're gonna use fictitious names. Please don't give me <laughs> people's real names. Give me some fictitious names, okay? Um, so, that, so I don't get brought into your life experience. Use fictitious names, um, true to the role, all right? Talk about who those key players are, talk about the roles. All right, and then share your process and you know what that looks like. Is it a, is it a, a change? Is it still being processed, right? Um, or did you accomplish the change and you have moved on to the next level? Or are you just now entering into this place? You know, talk about that. And so you're gonna submit that assignment. Again, the, um, the link, link for that is tinyurl.com struggle, excuse me, tinyurl.com slash struggle to change. And so on the, um, um, podcast, I'm going to put that in our summary and that way you can hyperlink it and go to that assignment. Again, this assignment is um, uh, self-paced. You don't have to turn it in today or tomorrow, whenever you're ready. And then I'll give you some personalized feedback based upon what your submission is. Okay. So I thank you for listening. Um, this has been um, our um, one of our prophetic um, courses in um, course in prophetic teaching the struggle to change. We came out of Genesis 32, 22 through 32. This is for my satiric prophetic um, podcast followers, but this assignment is for students enrolled in the Soteri Apostolic College of Biblical Studies. So I look forward to hearing from you all. God bless you. We love you in Jesus name. Amen.